All right, uh, why don't we get started here? Hello, everyone. Um, so our talk today is from Professor Lisa Downing, whom I will introduce here in a minute. And uh, she'll be speaking to us today about John Locke's conception of qualities and powers. Now, I just wanna make a comment about the juxtaposition of Lisa's talk today with John Steele's talk on Monday. So if you remember, John Steele uh, gave us a talk on Monday um, about his multiverse program in set theory. And on the surface, there's a huge jump from the topic on Monday to the topic today. And I wanna just say a little bit about why the topic isn't as big, jump isn't as big as you might think. So Penn, as we know, um, and as many of us also have, an interest in the philosophy of set theory and in particular in the question of new axiom candidates in set theory. Now, when you ask about axiom candidates and set theory, you quickly get to the question, what criteria should be used in judging the among axiom candidates? And if you ask about the proper criteria for axiom candidates, this quickly becomes a metaphilosophical question. So metaphilosophy, that's the philosophy of philosophy, asks second order questions about philosophy itself, including what kind of question is a philosophical question, if there is such a thing, as a distinctly philosophical question? And what kind of evidence should philosophers use in answering philosophical questions? Now, Penn's answer to this question, as we all know, is what she calls second philosophy. And I think John Burgess is gonna tell us a little bit more about second philosophy next week and give us some reflections on it. Now, second philosophy is opposed to what one might call first philosophy, the view that there are distinctly philosophical questions and distinctly philosophical kinds of evidence. Now, if that's the villain, you might ask, where'd the villain come from? Where did this conception of philosophy as first philosophy come from? And a prima facie plausible candidate is that it was the early moderns, starting with Descartes, what with their dream arguments and their distinctions between primary and secondary qualities, who were the first offenders. But as it turns out, Penn, like many others, have grown skeptical that this is really how the history goes. So, but maybe if we can come to understand our philosophical ancestors, the great thinkers of the canon of early modern philosophy, what they thought about what they were doing before what they called natural philosophy came to be so cleanly separated from what we now call plain old philosophy, then maybe we can get a clearer image of what the work of a second philosopher might look like. And then second philosophy is done by people like Penn and her fellow travelers, won't seem like a departure from its history, but a return to the better days of a Descartes or a Locke. So with that, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker today, Lisa Downing. Lisa is professor and department chair of the Department of Philosophy at The Ohio State University. She's an expert in the history of early modern philosophy, in the history of early modern natural philosophy, and a leading scholar in the field we now call HOPAS, the history of the philosophy of science. So one thing that Lisa shows us in her work is that these three areas, the history of philosophy, the history of natural philosophy, and the history of philosophy of science, weren't really that separate, if at all, in the early modern period. And in this vein, Lisa has written, among other things, uh, important work on the early modern um, history of mechanism, on the theory of gravitation, and on causation. And today, she'll be speaking to us on qualities and powers in Locke. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm deeply honored to be here as a part of uh, this event honoring Penn Maddy. Uh, I only wish I could be in Irvine uh, for the occasion, not to mention being in Southern California in January. Um, so I have a PowerPoint to go with this talk um, and partly so as to ensure that there's no giant image of my <laughs> head in the middle of uh, everyone's screen. I'm gonna screen share that PowerPoint. Um, so we need to start the thing. Um, sorry. Slight, I thought I'd done this already. Slideshow play from start. And now back to share the screen. 
the usual dance. There we go. Uh, right, so um, by the way, you'll notice that uh, Boyle um, is appearing here. He appears in parentheses and short paragraphs uh, here and there in the paper. Um, I found that I, um, uh, I found myself having trouble deciding how big a role he should play in the paper. He's there um, partly, well, obviously he's a huge influence on Locke, uh, but also I think he merits um, Maddie's title of natural philosopher more thoroughly uh, than Locke does. And that's one thing uh, he's doing here. Okay. So Locke's version of the distinction between primary and secondary qualities has long been taken uh, to be especially distinguished despite his clear deaths to Boyle, Descartes, Galileo, and others. Nevertheless, debate still continues on the precise form that the distinction actually took for Locke. The last decade has seen intense interest in Locke's metaphysics, which has produced prominent uh, new analyses of uh, the distinction as a metaphysical distinction in Locke by scholars, including Jacobides, Ott, Pasnow, and Stewart. Um, here, I'll critically consider some of this recent work on the way to defending answers to three questions. One, uh, what is it to be a primary quality for Locke? Two, how are primary and secondary qualities related exactly? And three, what status do secondary qualities have for Locke and Boyle? What can and should we say about their ontology? Uh, with regard to three, I'll question some recent interpretations that see Locke as advocating a kind of anti-realism about secondary qualities, as well as interpretations that label him as some sort of reductionist about secondary qualities. I argue further that it turns out that Locke's epistemology uh, interestingly and perhaps surprisingly constrains his view of secondary qualities. And here we can see a sharp distinction between Locke and Boyle. Uh, along the way, uh, I consider the question of how well uh, both Boyle and Locke exemplify uh, Maddie's natural philosopher. And here I'm thinking in particular of a, a recent um, paper, the Pacific APA presidential address. So what kind of distinction is the primary secondary quality distinction? Um, I'll begin uh, with this basic question. And here I like to start uh, with a quotation from uh, Mitzi Lee, Mi Kyung Lee. Uh, she helpfully identifies, I think, two different ways of understanding the distinction itself. Um, she writes, Thus, the primary secondary quality distinction can be understood in two ways. One, it's a way of marking off a metaphysical distinction between essential and non-essential properties of matter and of bodies. As such, it promises to be a basic feature of any materialist ontology, and hence one would expect any theory of matter to have commitments on such a question. Two, in another sense, it's a way of marking off those sensible qualities which seem to be particularly subjective that is, dependent on the responses that per perceivers have to them. Qualities like colors and flavors give rise to conflicting appearances in different perceivers, and this in turn seems to have something to do with the epistemic facts about our sense modalities and modes of perception. This looks like two different ways of generating the distinction and identifying which qualities are in which category. On the one hand, you might think the essential or foundational qualities are the key to the distinction and are identified first via one's views about matter. On the other hand, you might think there is a direct route to the secondary qualities by locating the qualities that are subjective, that is perceiver dependent. Thus, somewhat crudely, version one of the distinction starts with primary qualities and is matter driven, while version two of the distinction starts with secondary qualities and is subjectivity driven. In this paper, I'll consider the distinction as it is found in the early modern period, and my focus will be on uh, Locke and to a lesser extent on Boyle. I follow the mainstream and contemporary Locke scholarship in supposing that uh, uh, 
and the tea leaves one is the best way to understand Locke's distinction. That is Locke's version of the distinction is matter driven. I think this is clearly also true of Galileo, Descartes, and Boyle. They have views about what body is like. Those views are views about which qualities are primary, and that's what's driving their versions of the distinction. They then need an account of where the other apparent qualities come from. That account makes crucial reference to appearance and the senses. So on this version one story, secondary qualities are leftover qualities. They are the directly observable qualities that aren't primary. The story told about these qualities may make them subjective in some way, but it's primary qualities that come first in the account. Nowadays, this is the mainstream view, both of Locke's version of the distinction, as well as of the distinction in the early modern period, generally, uh, and that's for an obvious reason. Uh, it's become commonplace to view the distinction as having emerged from new mechanist conceptions of matter put forward in the scientific revolution by Galileo, Descartes, Boyle, etc. They all come to the distinction as natural philosophers, as Maddie might say. This view is clearly correct, yet it should be noted that seeing the distinction, even in the early modern period, as subjectivity driven is not without significant textual support for where the distinction is supposed to be motivated by arguments from illusion or relativity arguments, there the distinction seems at least to be subjectivity driven. Thomas Hobbes, for example, uses relativity arguments to support a version of the distinction. Uh, and Pierre Bayle, as is relatively well known, portrays the distinction as driven by relativity arguments, though he also prefigures Berkeley in noting the weakness of such arguments. And Locke, uh, notoriously tells us about the water cold to one hand and warm to another. Uh, I guess I will read this passage out. Um, this is Locke's essay. Ideas being thus distinguished and understood, we may be able to give an account how the same water at the same time may produce the idea of cold by one hand and of heat by the other. Whereas it is impossible that the same water, if those ideas were really in it, should at the same time be both hot and cold. For if we imagine warmth as it is in our hands to be nothing but a certain sort of, certain sort and degree of motion in the minute particles of our nerves or animal spirits, we may understand how it is possible that the same water may at the same time produce the sensation of heat in one hand and cold in another. Um, as it happens, the consensus view of Locke's distinction as being matter true, matter driven, rather than subject subjectivity driven, rather than being uh, driven by relativity arguments. Um, the consensus view of it as being matter driven and deriving from mechanism has a convincing account of what's going on in that famous passage. There we should appreciate that Locke is exhibiting the explanatory power of the mechanist version of the doctrine of primary and secondary qualities. With the corpuscularian hypothesis, we can give an account of the phenomena, which phenomena include conflicting appearances. This interpretation fits uh, very well with Locke's text while making clear that on this interpretation, the primary secondary quality distinction is a matter driven distinction. While it is uh, less clear what to say about Hobbes, um, Bale, and others, more generally, we might say that observations about relativity and conflicting appearances may be brought in in order to exhibit what a matter driven version of the distinction can explain, or perhaps even as a sort of independent confirmation of the matter driven doctrine. In what follows, I'll take for granted that the distinction for Locke um, and Boyle and others is matter driven, um, as I think it clearly is for many in the 17th century. Uh, so primary qualities come first and Locke comes to the doctrine like Galileo, Descartes and Boyle did as a natural philosopher. But what exactly is a primary quality and how should we identify these qualities? How should we define and delimit primary qualities? Um, we can start here with a suggestion from that passage uh, from Mitzi Lee. She characterizes ver version one of the distinction as holding that primary qualities are the qualities that are essential to matter or body. 
Lee's characterization seems remarkably well suited to Galileo, especially uh, to his um, famously early articulation of the distinction in the assayer. Uh, recall a very famous passage from that discussion. This passage may be so well known that I ought not to read it out, but I think I need a few phrases at least. As soon as I conceive of a corporeal substance or um, or material, I feel drawn by the necessity of also conceiving that it is bounded and has this or that shape. Uh, nor can I by any stretch of the imagination separate from these conditions. However, my mind does not feel forced to regard as necessarily accompanied by such conditions as the following, that is white or red, bitter or sweet, noisy or quiet. Okay. Galileo singles out the primary qualities as those our minds feel forced to regard as in the corporeal body. Um, that the other qualities are not conceptually necessary to body, he reinforces with the suggestion that we wouldn't conceive of them if we lacked sensation. If we suppose that Galileo is making the assumption common in the period that conceptual, conceptual necessity tracks necessity, then it looks like primary qualities are just essential qualities, those that bodies cannot lack and still be bodies. Um, let's turn now to Locke to see how the suggestion that the primary qualities are the essential qualities might be applied. Uh, for Locke, that suggestion immediately raises the question, are we talking about nominal essences or real essences? If the answer is real essence or real essences, we might wonder why we can be so confident in supposing that we can identify the primary or essential qualities given Locke's epistemic modesty and his inclinations towards extreme pessimism about our knowledge of particular real essences. Um, Matthew Stewart in his uh, recent book, Locke's Metaphysics uh, from 2013, gives uh, the alternative answer. He gives the answer nominal essences. Um, great. Uh, Stewart's conceptualist interpretation of Locke posits that the primary qualities of bodies are just those that we take to be required in order to be body. That is those that we've enshrined in the nominal essence of body. This view is well motivated and then it nicely explains why Locke is so confident in his particular list of primary qualities, size, shape, solidity, and motion or rest. If we are simply identifying the content of our idea of body, uh, the genus of body as we've defined it, then we can easily make a list of primary qualities via the sort of reflection reported by Locke in the famous grain of wheat passage. Um, that's essay 289. Um, I don't have that on the slide. Uh, I submit, however, that the conceptualist account of primary qualities faces serious problems. The most straightforward is that when Locke discusses primary qualities, it seems pretty clear that he's discussing the nature of reality rather than our classif classificatory schemes. Um, this is most obvious where he declares that primary qualities are really in them, whether anyone's senses perceive them or no, as opposed to those which are imputed and nothing in the objects themselves but powers. Further evidence that Locke connects his notion of primary qualities to reality rather than to our conceptual schemes can be found in the way he connects them to modifications of matter and describes himself as having detoured into physical enquiries further, further than he intended. Um, thus, it seems primary quality or primary qualities should be logically connected to the real essence of matter, not merely to its nominal essence. Turns out there's evidence that Locke sees that connection. Uh, in 467, he writes, uh, we know not the real constitutions of substances on which each secondary quality particularly depends. That requires some unpacking to see why it's interesting. Real constitution is systematically used by Locke as synonymous with real essence. Um, 
So uh, he's saying in 467 that uh, secondary qualities depend on real essences, but of course he usually describes secondary qualities as depending on primary qualities. So that highlights the logical relationship between real essence and primary quality. Okay, um, right, so I think, uh, I think primary qualities need to be um, primarily connected to uh, real essences rather than simply relativized to nominal essences. Uh, for a recent interpretation of Lockean primary qualities, which does uh, ground them in, um, re in real essence, does ground them in metaphysics, uh, we can turn to Michael Jacovides, uh, his 2017 book. Um, he identifies primary qualities as qualities that are propria of matter. He sees Locke as following in a scholastic tradition here. Uh, I've got a quotation from him. On the slide, he says, Locke defines primary qualities as those that are utterly inseparable from the body in what a state soever it be. Uh, this definition, he says, makes them propria of body where proprium is taken in something like Sanderson's second sense, a property of A is a feature that all A's have at all times. This rightly in my view, connects primary qualities to the way bodies actually are Nevertheless, uh, I want to suggest that it isn't optimal as a definition of primary quality for Locke. Um, suppose bodies have some type of basic quality that cannot be causally derived from an underlying quality or qualities, but that this quality isn't found in all body or matter. I submit that Locke ought to and would regard such a quality as primary. He doesn't consider the possibility uh, because he generally assumes, following Boyle, who builds it into the content of his mechanism, that matter is Catholic, that is, that it is everywhere the same. He ought, however, to regard that as an empirical issue, and his commitment to Catholic matter, that is, matter that is everywhere the same, is less deep than his commit commitment to a metaphysics of primary qualities. Thus, we ought not to define primary quality in a way that builds in that assumption. Oops. Uh, Jacovides' propria interpretation falls short, I think, by taking inseparability the wrong way. Contra Jacovides, primary qualities are inseparable or ineliminable for Locke, not because they must belong to all matter as such, but because they are basic, not derived, and so can't be eliminated where they occur by some sort of decomposition. Okay. Um, the most Lockean of the recent treatments of Locke's notion of primary quality by my lights is Robert Pasnow's. Pasnow interprets Locke as, in, as intending first and foremost, a thesis about what is explanatorily basic in the natural world. Uh, I think that's right. He concludes, uh, yeah, I have this quote here. He concludes that, quote, the essence of Locke's primary secondary quality distinction is an empirical claim consisting in the theses of explanatory priority, universality, and causal primacy. He labels this as, as an empirical claim, and this requires some clarification. I take it that he means that it is an empirical claim that the mechanist list of qualities satisfy those criteria. Uh, I agree with this. Um, I think that's precisely Locke's view, though I also think that it's an hypothesis, right? It's, it's an hypothesis that that Boylean list are the primary qualities. Um, and he eventually sees, because of Newton, that uh, there's reason to distance ourselves from that, uh, from that empirical hypothesis. Um, okay, right. Uh, which is to say Locke has, in a sense, and I'll reflect on this sense uh, shortly, um, Locke has a metaphysical notion of primary quality, and it is, in his view, an empirical question in the end, which qualities are in fact primary. 
um, though Locke thinks we have some reason to privilege mechanism as an hypothesis about the answer to that. And also eventually thinks we also have reason gained from experience, gained from Newton uh, to distance ourselves from that hypothesis. Uh, the reason in favor of it is how it fits with our context. The reason against it is doesn't fit with Newton. Um, Paz now notes that universality floats free of his other cr two criteria. And I think this is exactly right. Um, that was my um, complaint about Jacobides um, in effect. Uh, it can only be an empirical claim that the qualities that have causal primacy and explanatory priority are also universal. The mechanists are uh, all inclined to assume this, but they ought to be prepared to revise that assumption. Um, it's not, however, I wanna say an ordinary empirical claim for Locke that some qualities have causal primacy and explanatory priority. Rather, it's part of a basic metaphysical picture that he expects particular physical theories to fill in. Um, once universality is admitted, I'm in close agreement with Pasno's uh, analysis, though it's unclear to me what reason there is to separate explanatory priority and causal primacy. If qualities have causal primacy, they presumably must be used in full explanations and if the only relevant explanation here is causal explanation, then explanatory priority brings with it causal primacy. Uh, I suggest the formula um, intrinsic and foundational to characterize primary qualities. If a quality must in principle be used in explanation, then it is foundational. And if it is foundational, it cannot be explained away. Um, and so has to be used at least in explaining itself. I include intrinsic as well to try to capture an assumption I take to be typical of the moderns and to be deeply held by them, that extrinsic properties are always explicable in terms of intrinsic properties plus something like spatial position. These intrinsic and foundational qualities are the qualities that characterize the real constitutions of particular bodies because they ground their further powers. I've said that the distinction is a metaphysical one for Locke and that it is not an ordinary empirical claim that bodies have intrinsic and foundational qualities. Does this mean that Locke has strayed from the path of Maddie's natural philosopher? I don't think so, uh, not yet, though this requires trying to say more about what I mean by calling the distinction metaphysical for Locke. I mean two things at least. One is that the distinction concerns how things are rather than how things seem to us that is, which qualities are primary, in the most important sense anyway, is not settled by our current concept of body. The other is that Locke uh, views the distinction as more abstract than particular physical theories. Uh, the primary secondary quality distinction would not be refuted by an empirical refutation of Boylean mechanism. Rather, Locke expects any physical theory to assign primary qualities to matter. Nevertheless, I think it is both obviously and deeply true that Locke came to the distinction via natural philosophy and via mechanism, and also that one might plausibly describe the distinction as the most abstract or most metaphysical part of mechanism. Okay. From primary qualities to secondary qualities. Right. Here I, I leave my uh, comfort zone. I'm um, more confidence in my views of primary qualities than my views on secondary qualities, but there's some reason for that. Uh, another question still to be addressed is, if secondary qualities are to be defined in relation to primary qualities, then how so? The rough idea here is that secondary qualities are leftover qualities. The apparent qualities that aren't primary must be secondary, but this requires some refining. One notorious textual problem in Locke that motivates some of the refining is posed by a passage, famous among Locke scholars anyway, where Locke seems to tell us that all qualities are powers. Uh, so this is where he distinguishes between ideas and qualities um, in 288. Whatsoever the mind perceives in itself or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, that I call idea. And the power to produce any idea in our mind, I call quality of the subject wherein that power is. 
thus a snowball having the power to produce in us the ideas of white, cold, and round, the powers to produce those ideas in us as they are in the snowball, I call qualities, and as they are sensations or perceptions in our understandings, I call them ideas. Right, so it seems that all qualities are powers in this passage. The passage is much debated, some commentators discount it, some build interpretations around it. Uh, I think it should not be discounted, but I don't think it's that hard to explain. Locke is considering here the qualities that correspond to our ideas. That is to say, observable or macroscopic qualities. Those qualities are all powers, powers to produce ideas in us. The question of which of the observable qualities uh, which of the observable qualities, if any, are primary, is for Locke the question of which of those qualities are more than mere powers, that is, which correspond to ideas that provide us with an accurate conception of the way bodies are in themselves. Locke appeals here to his notion of resemblance. Some of our ideas of bodies may resemble or accurately represent the foundational intrinsic properties of bodies. Probably. Yeah, okay. Um, other ideas, by contrast, threaten to mislead us. The qualities corresponding to the resembling ideas count as primary qualities, those which do not are secondary. Thus, both the intrinsic foundational properties of bodies, which might belong only to submicroscopic parts and so be unobservable, and those macroscopic qualities which are powers and are causally dependent on more fundamental qualities, but which provide us with an accurate conception of the intrinsic irreducible properties of bodies count as primary qualities for Locke. Um, the category of primary quality is thus at the level of quality instances, uh, a disjunctive one, um, because macroscopic primary qualities are powers to produce ideas in us. Um, while submicroscopic ones are not. The sorts of qualities that are intrinsic and foundational in bodies are the primary qualities, those that aren't are secondary. What secondary qualities are, are powers, mere powers because they don't resemble, they don't give us an accurate conception of the qualities that are actually intrinsic and foundational in bodies. Secondary qualities then are mere powers. How should we understand that claim. That is a question that I won't attempt to reach the bottom of. Uh, I'll argue for two main points in what follows. Contra several, several recent interpreters, um, we should understand Locke as putting forward a kind of realism about secondary qualities. And second, uh, we should not be quick to assume that Locke is endorsing reductionism about secondary qualities. Okay. Uh, first, let's establish a bit of context. There are many different answers given or suggested in the 17th century to the question, what are secondary qualities such as colors? Possible answers would seem to include colors are ideas or ideas or sensations, states of sense organs, arrangements of particles on the surfaces of objects, relations between objects and perceivers, or powers in objects to produce ideas in us. Descartes' official position, um, uh, and here I'm following Schmaltz, possibly not the best person to follow, but. Uh, Descartes' official position seems to be that terms like red are equivocal. We can use them to talk about sensations in us, which are modes of mind, or we can use them to talk about an unknown configuration of the parts of bodies that is the source of that sensation. In Boyle, one can find bits of text that suggest almost all of the possible positions just mentioned. In the past, I've suggested that this is because Boyle finds the philosophical question, what is color? Uh, a little too nice in the old sense for his tastes. 
what's really important on his view is first that we realize what sensory qualities are not, namely distinct qualities in bodies on a par with size, shape, uh, and motion. And second, that we understand the basic account of how corp corpuscularian bodies give rise to an experience of sensory qualities via their relation to our senses. This positions Boyle as a natural philosopher par excellence uh, for Maddie, I think. Um, nevertheless, I do think there's a broad view of color and other sensible qualities that Boyle converges on as is brought out by his famous extended comparison of sensible qualities with a key's ability to open a lock. Um, and what, uh, what, that, um, what that points us to, what I think his uh, core view of the sensible qualities is, is that they are powers or capacities in things, in bodies that, that derive from their relations um, to perceivers. Um, despite having written quite a bit about Locke's primary secondary quality distinction, I've mostly avoided questions about the ontology of secondary qualities. They are, after all, leftover qualities on the interpretation I argued for earlier. Uh, I was forced to reflect on this question some over the last decade, though, by encountering interpretations of Locke's um, views of secondary qualities that I realized that I wanted to disagree with. Um, and more recently, uh, uh, um, uh, Maddie's article has made me reflect a little further on whether it would be better to avoid attributing to Locke uh, such a view to the extent that it is underdetermined by natural philosophy. To foreshadow, it might be better, but it turns out that the essay requires attributing to Locke a surprisingly definite view. Locke is most commonly applauded for putting secondary qualities unambiguously in bodies. Let's see, okay. Um, for putting secondary qualities unambiguously in bodies. Ideas are in us, but qualities are in bodies. They are powers that bodies have to produce ideas in us. This has often been characterized as a form of realism about secondary qualities, uh, where the contrast is presumably with idealism about secondary qualities. Nevertheless, a number of recent interpretations of Locke either explicitly or implicitly attribute anti-realism about secondary qualities uh, to him, according to which secondary qualities either do not exist or are radically mind dependent. I think this is a mistake. Locke holds that secondary qualities exist and that they are in bodies. Uh, Jacovides forthrightly embraces an anti-realist interpretation uh, on his view uh, of Locke, secondary qualities are not real beings, aren't entities of any kind in bodies, and thus do not exist. Instead, on his view, Locke provides us with a semantics for secondary quality terms, which allows us to keep talking about colors despite their irreality. Uh, this view gets some textual motivation from Locke's emphatic declarations that it's the primary qualities that are really in bodies. But to counter Jacobides, when Locke tells us that secondary qualities are nothing in objects, he typically elaborates explaining that they are nothing in objects but powers, mere powers or bare powers, that is powers whose resulting ideas mislead us about what the objects are actually like. It is true that Locke would deny that these powers are uh, race, R-E-S, right, the Latin for thing. Uh, I never know how to pronounce that effectively um, without also displaying it, which sadly I've not done here. Um, Locke would deny uh, that they are scholastic uh, race, R-E-S, items separable from what they qualify in the manner of scholastic real qualities. And it sometimes sounds as if this plausible point is the one Jacobides wants to make in stating that Locke denies that secondary qualities are real beings. However, by interpreting Locke as supplying a semantics instead of or in place of an ontology for secondary qualities, Jacobides has Locke supposing that natural philosophy has taught us that there are no colors in bodies and that color talk is merely a manner of speaking. 
But that seems clearly an overreaction to mechanism, and I don't think it is Locke's reaction. Two other recent commentators also land Locke in anti-realism, but in a more complicated fashion, which, um, which I, will, I will spare us uh, for the most part. Uh, and here I'm talking about uh, Walter Ott and uh, Matthew Stewart again. Uh, they analyze secondary qualities as powers, rightly in my view, and then quite plausibly analyze powers as relations, but offer strongly anti-realist interpretations of relations for Locke, uh, such that it turns out that powers either do not exist um, or are, uh, that's Stuart, I think, and, or are radically mind dependent, that's Ott. Uh, in a longer version of this paper, I prosecute this case in detail, but here I will cut to the chase. Those conclusions are very unlockian, um, though the, the chain, uh, the basic chain of reasoning uh, from powers to relations uh, and connect and uh, then motivate an anti-realist treatment of uh, relations, that, that, that chain is a, is a pretty plausible one. Uh, the conclusions are unlucky and, and have to be avoided by a more, judicious, a more judicious interpretation of lock on relations. If sensible qualities don't exist, if powers don't exist, uh, Locke's philosophy is in a great deal of trouble um, and an extra reason for that will turn up uh, at the end of the paper, which is approaching. So I conclude, albeit rather briskly here, that these contemporary anti-realist interpretations of Locke's secondary qualities have some clear disadvantages. Uh, in the last part of the paper, I offer a general argument that Locke must be some sort of realist about powers and thus about secondary qualities, though by realism uh, here, I mean something fairly minimal. He has to hold that powers exist and that they are in objects, um, though not necessarily solely in objects. Okay. Um, a further issue about the, uh, about the status of Locke's powers is whether he supposes that they are fully reducible to their causal basis. Both Pasnow and Ott argue that Locke must be a reductionist about the powers that are secondary qualities. Um, they, they think this a boil uh, as well. Um, Pasnow writes that Locke must be a reductionist because the alternative is just too unlockian to countenance. And here's some Pasnow. Uh, he thinks if talk of powers were ontologically committing for Locke, powers would be, he says, bare dispositions in this sense. They would be merely conditionally actual and they would not be causally efficacious or would be so only derivatively. But he thinks neither Locke nor Boyle could plausibly be held to believe in such things. Uh, I think both Pasnow's claims are disputable. As for one, uh, his claim that an unreduced power must be merely conditionally actual. The nature of a power is that it is a power or ability and that is actual as long as the thing has the power. So I submit powers need not be understood as merely conditionally actual. Uh, as for two, the worry that unreduced powers would not have causal efficacy, I'm tempted to say that this is some sort of category mistake for powers aren't supposed to have causal efficacy, they're supposed to be causal efficacy. Uh, still, there's something right about Pasnow's point that it's the primary qualities that are doing the causing for Locke, or perhaps better, that it is substances doing the causing, but which effects follow depends on their primary qualities. Some substances, because of their primary qualities, can cause in us an idea of redness, which is to say that those substances have the power or ability that is the quality of redness. Um, but I think that's just what Locke should allow, although he sometimes speaks of powers as though they themselves were causally efficacious. In fact, powers are manifestations of the causal efficacy of substances. And that's to suggest that Pasnow's two is not really a problem once we consider the relation between substances, primary qualities, and their powers. In sum, 
In neither Paznaz 1 nor 2 do we find the basis for an argument that powers must be fully reducible to some underlying basis. Because one is incorrect, unreduced powers are not merely conditionally actual, and two is unproblematic. Powers aren't supposed to be causally efficacious, for powers don't have powers, rather they are powers. Uh, the question obviously raised by any reductionist inter interpretation, uh, such as those proposed by Pasnow and Ott, is to what should powers, uh, for example, secondary qualities, be reduced exactly? Both are quite elusive on this question. Pasnow states that powers for Boyle and Locke, quote, are nothing more than a corpuscularian structure embedded in a certain sort of world, unquote. He also notes that powers have a relational character. These are reconcilable, he explains, because his nominal approach to powers, quote, licenses an ecumenical tolerance for different ways of individuating powers, e.g. as relative or non-relative to perceivers, unquote. Surely this is too convenient. If powers are to be fully reduced, as Paz now holds, mustn't they be reduced to something in particular? If powers aren't being reduced to anything in particular, then it seems that we end up with something like Jacobiti's interpretation, according to which Locke denies the existence of secondary qualities while leaving us with the semantics for talk about them. Ott too wants powers and so secondary qualities to be reducible. He too is somewhat non-committal non about how this would go. Powers are supposed to be multilaterally reducible to the qualified body in addition to whatever further circumstances of that body feature in the relation that is the power. But how much of the circumstances are to be included? If every relevant item is included, powers degenerate into actual causings. Otis Cavalier about reduction talk versus supervenience talk, stating that, quote, if we prefer, we can say that on the reductive view, a power supervenes on the relevant mechanical qualities of the objects it relates. Fixing the mechanical qualities of a set of objects will fix their powers. But this isn't just a matter of preference, for supervenience talk is much less restrictive than reduction talk. To say that secondary qualities supervene on primary ones requires only that secondary qualities never differ without a difference in primary qualities. And of course, that requires covariation, not identification. Uh, I think it is clear. And to this modest extent, I agree with Pasnow and Ott that Locke would accept some version of the supervenience claim. I think that much follows from what I've uh, elsewhere called Locke's essentialism, which isn't a great name. Locke holds, I think, that once you've specified the primary qualities, real essences, and spatial arrangements, everything else should follow, including powers. But should we regard the powers that follow as existence? Ott and Pasnow think that must look to Boyle and Locke like a dreadful error, perhaps a lapse into scholasticism. Um, but is that so plain? It would, of course, again, be a mistake to regard the power that follows as a scholastic real quality, a thing in the sense of being capable of separate existence. Uh, it would also be a dreadful error from their point of view, the key error, the error that they care most about, if we suppose that the power that is redness in a body resembled my idea of redness. But that we should suppose that particular primary qualities rightly situated give rise to a countless host of abilities, including abilities to cause ideas and perceivers, seems exactly what, like what Boyle and Locke would want. Arguably, it is exactly what they urge us to notice. I've argued that the reductionist interpretations offered by Ott and Pasnow are under-motivated and under-characterized, but are they refutable? Okay. Um, but are they refutable? If Boyle and Locke are good natural philosophers, perhaps they should just take no position on the question of whether powers should be identified with that which uh, grounds or gives rise to them or not. I think this is arguably true of Boyle. Interestingly, and perhaps surprisingly, it turns out uh, not to be true of Locke. That is, he can't take that agnostic view. 
Um, turning first to Boyle, as Peter Anstey documents at length, Boyle says things uh, that sound reductionist to our contemporary ears, and he says things that don't. The things that sound reductionist can be explained away as meaning to deny only real qualities separable from bodies, or the things that don't sound reductionist can be explained away as speaking with the vulgar, where you talk about sensible quality powers as though they were things. It's quite plausible to assert here, I think, that he simply isn't focused on the question and that it's a mistake to interpret him as having a view that he doesn't have. Uh, interestingly, however, Locke cannot hold that powers should be identified with their causal basis. This stems from the fact that, quite unlike Boyle, his central project is epistemological, and he makes epistemological claims that rule it out. We should recollect that powers are extremely important to Locke's system and to his epistemological conclusions. This is an importance, by the way, that can be traced back to the early drafts of the essay. Locke declares unreservedly um, in Book 2, Chapter 31, that all our simple ideas are adequate. Okay, a bunch of quotations here that I'll make use of. Um, all our simple ideas are adequate. And adequate ideas are those which, quote, perfectly represent those archetypes which the mind supposes them taken from, which it intends them to stand for, and to which it refers them. Further, the archetypes of uh, simple ideas, such as the ideas of redness, roundness, solidity, bitterness, ideas of primary and secondary qualities alike. Notice uh, the archetypes of these simple ideas are all powers. Okay. Why are all those simple ideas adequate? Uh, well, Locke explains in 231.2, because being nothing but the effects of certain powers in things, fitted and ordained by God to produce such sensations in us, they cannot but be correspondent and adequate to those powers. And we are sure they agree to the reality of things. For if sugar produce in us the ideas which we call whiteness and sweetness, we are sure there is a power in sugar to produce those ideas in our minds or else they could not have been produced by it. And so each sensation answering the power that operates on any of our senses the idea so produced is a real idea and not a fiction of the mind, which has no power to produce any simple idea and cannot but be adequate since it ought only to answer that power. And so all simple ideas are adequate. Uh, this is a crucial uh, point for Locke um, and it commits him to a lot. For the claim that all our simple ideas are adequate to come out true, it is necessary that our ideas be aimed at powers, that there be powers, and that those powers be completely known. Anything less makes them inadequate. Um, quoting Locke again, inadequate ideas are such which are but a partial or incomplete representation of those archetypes to which they are referred. Um, this requires some sort of realism about powers. Further, it rules out um, identity reductionism because the purported reduction base is typically unknown while the powers Locke holds are fully known, adequately represented, which is to say perfectly represented. Uh, powers must remain real, easily known, and readily connect, uh, collected from the phenomena in order for our um, ontology of powers to remain in harmony with Locke's epistemological use of powers. Um, why is this not true for Boyle? Mm -hmm. Well, in a way that's quite obvious, Boyle's project is not epistemological. That's true, uh, more could be said. Locke sees a need to secure some knowledge in a world where the real essences of things are beyond our grasp. The knowledge we have is of objects, the knowledge we have, right, in the full strong sense, 
is of objects as bundles of powers. Boyle is not in the same epistemological business, but he is also much more optimistic about the possibility of progress in determining both corpuscular and textures and their resulting powers. Uh, if we wish that Locke had followed Boyle here um, in rising above uh, questions about reductionism, uh, we might wonder what should change. Uh, I do think Locke is deeply committed to powers that exist and are readily within our grasp, uh, but the claim of perfect representation that is built into adequacy is arguably um, more than he requires. Uh, and there I will stop. Oh. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, that was great. Uh, so why don't we take a five minute break or so to um, give ourselves a chance to um, uh, clear our thoughts and formulate our questions and we'll reconvene at 4.05. Sounds good.
Okay, everyone, let's try to reconvene here in a minute or so. So we can get ourselves back in the meeting mode. All right, everyone. So I'll be acting as moderator here. And if you want to ask a question, um, you can just write in the chat the word question. Um, and then I'll keep a cue as you write in. And um, um, I'll call on people on the queue. So I'll actually get a piece of paper ready now to start the queue. Um, but before we start the queue, um, um, I wanted to see if uh, Professor Maddy, you had a question or comment you wanted to make first. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you, Lisa, for this paper. That was really fascinating. I uh, very much enjoyed it. So just to make sure I've got the story. Um, so Locke in his uh, epistemic pessimism thinks we're not gonna be able to get the real essence. Uh, um, and if mechanism is right, that means he's not, we're not going to get the corpuscular microstructure. But he doesn't want to leave us with nothing. And so he says, what we can get is the powers. We can know is the powers. And since red is the power, that means red can't be the, the microstructure. Right, so not reductionism. That's the line. The, so the, the not reductionism, it really comes just from that claim about adequacy, which is why one might, you know, wonder whether, oh, right. Uh, right, right. whether that was overreaching, or whether he even noticed the, or sort of fully noticed the strength of what he was claiming, um, because uh, the, um, the claim is that um, our ideas perfectly represent their archetypes um, uh, where the archetype is just a power to cause an idea. Right. And if that power is a complex microstructure, uh, then um, it doesn't seem that the idea could perfectly represent that. Right, 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 right. Okay, and that's so- driven home more, even further by what he says about inadequacy. Right, so- um... So we could know the power without knowing it perfectly. Yeah. And in that case, it could be the unknown, the thing that causes it, but we don't know what and all that kind of talk that we hear. Right, so he could be neutral about the reductionism question if he right. withdrew the claim of adequacy. Right, right, um, right. And I mean, he does uh, he uses that notion of adequacy in sort of the epistemological parts of the, uh, the essay. Um, but it, I mean, it, it, I don't see that it's crucial to him mm -hmm. here, um, the claim of perfect representation. All right. Okay, so that means that he's, but if you're right about this, that means he can't be indifferent to the sort of where to locate color question. Right. Um, in the way that Boyle may be, right? And so then do you, you have to sort of explain away some of the past, because you know, uh, I think Locke, people who talk about Locke's view find passages that support all kinds of different things in the same way that you do with Boyle, right? Yeah. So you don't have to explain away some of these passages that make it sound like he means one thing or the other. Right, so I mean, a standard thing I think that's a common thing to say uh, about Locke on color is that um, sometimes he seems to think that um, it's our ideas that have the best title to be called right. red, even though redness, the quality, is a power in body. <laughs> right. right. Um, I mean, and even more broadly, uh, and a, a sort of an easy trick in talking about Locke is if you find a passage you don't like, he's, he's talking 
he's he's fallen into talking about ideas instead of things. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. right. I think that's so you want to say he's, uh, in my terms, not as good a second, not as good a natural philosopher as, as Boyle, maybe, but uh, uh, yeah, at, at he, least he's not doing that particular thing that I claim in the paper that in the in the talk that uh, right or the natural yeah, philosophers he, did. I claim right. they did. Right. Right. Uh, right. Correct. But I, I would have thought probably you think he's not as much a natural philosopher as I claim because of this broader metaphysical framework that he has um that right or you don't think that's necessarily a mark against him in the in this particular yeah i think that's a very interesting question um and and um and i appreciated being prodded to think more hmm. along these lines um right so yeah in in past work uh i've argued that the yeah. primary secondary quality distinction is a metaphysical distinction and I thought it was useful to um, to think more about what I mean by that um, and I mean I I think what led me to that formulation in the past is uh, I um, I didn't think that it was just well I didn't think he's uh, I think it transcends the Boylean list right Right. So I think uh, he um, could be, and in fact was eventually led to doubt that Boyle had a um, complete and correct account of what the primary mm -hmm. qualities of bodies are. But I don't think that undermined the primary secondary quality distinction in his view. Right. I think the distinction is more abstract than that. I certainly think how he got to that distinction and his commitment to it was via mechanism and then I'm not sure I really know how to arbitrate the question, right? So you might say, well, he got to it by a mechanism, but in the end, it was a metaphysical distinction. I, I'm not sure how to decide between mm -hmm. it's the um, you know, most uh, ab abstract or metaphysical part of the physical mm -hmm. theory, mm -hmm. which allows for a lot of variation in the mm -hmm. physical theory or on the other hand saying it's properly metaphysical, whatever that means. Right, right, and I right. thought um, that uh, it was in harmony with your view of the natural philosopher and that uh, the main thing you stress is that is um, getting to these views by considering reality and our place in it, an investigation right. that at least like includes empirical investigation so right. I thought, well, that's true of Locke. Well, I think before, in the paper on mechanism, the connection you draw with Scientia is so strong mm -hmm. that it starts to feel like, uh, you know, there's kind of a non-naturalistic thing going on there. The requirement that it flow from and so on is right. a little weird from our point of view. Right. Um, and yeah, one thing I have touched on in past work is uh, so um, Locke thought the particular list of uh, list of primary qualities was subject to empirical investigation and empirical mm -hmm. uh, refutation but he um, I, I think he doesn't He's not like he's not alive to the possibility of the uh, framework of primary quality in real essence being uh, yeah. being refuted. Right. Um, should he be right? If you made him think about that, what would he say? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm I guess I'm inclined to think he he would admit that it's possible that reality doesn't conform to that, but then he thinks it would be in a very deep way uh, incomprehensible to us. Right, right. If I may, just one more question here. The, this requirement of intelligibility is partly what was a bad idea, right? To think that the, those yeah. fundamental things had to be ones that right. we you know, right. uh, 
H how uh, committed to that do you think he was? What would you have thought if somebody came along and said, well, geez, you know, the things, the real explanations are these ones and they aren't the ones that, you know, you're going to be able to get from your sense impressions. Um, how, how bad would he think that if that were to, if he were, that were explained to him? Um, I, um, I'm, I'm not sure I got the no, Not, not clear. Okay. Okay. So um, he thinks that whatever the fundamental. Oh, shoot. And now. Sorry, my screen was also frozen for a minute, but um, it's back now. Are you okay? <laughs> are we, are we, uh, are Hopefully. We connect, are we connected here? Um, he, he, the grain of wheat, right, is, it takes us that you start from sense perception, then you get, look, see, these are the things that will be the fundamental guys. Um, but that turned out to be not a good assumption for physical theory to be based right. on. Right. Um, and I'm wondering how catastrophic would he have thought that if, if, if he had lived long enough to have the physicist explain this to him, how bad would that have been for his view? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> that um, yeah. So I think, I mean, I guess I think he did confront that to a certain extent in that With he gravity. thinks, yeah. New right, Newton has yeah. shown uh, that um, the world outruns our conceptions of it. Uh, I don't think that, um, and, and Boyle's theory can't be complete and correct. Uh, I don't think that made him question the framework of real essence and primary quality. I was uh, thinking maybe gravity was something that we do experience. Uh, well, attraction and repulsion. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can feel a magnet or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, That's why I, mean, I was what, thinking. What puzzles Locke about gravity is the apparent action at a distance, and he doesn't think you experience that. that. Okay. You experience things that need to be explained by it. Okay. Okay. I would let, let other people have their questions. I, there are a bunch of them already. Yeah, I see. Um, John first. You're muted, John. Uh, so uh, thank you, Lisa. That was so elegantly done that it created an illusion of understanding Locke in, in the <laughs> and following you interpretation among some of us who probably are actually very far from being able to do so. Uh, I wondered whether you could just by way of illustration of the main ideas, say just a word about the bearing of all this on the Molino problem, specifically, what's the relation between the power to produce the tactile idea of a shape and the power to produce the visual idea of the same shape? Uh, hmm. um, right, okay. So this is, I have not been thinking about Locke on the uh, Molly New problem. So you might have to remind me of stuff. So my first, uh, my first inclination is to say um, they're, I mean, they're, they're co-located. <laughs> so we're uh, aware of them. Oh, right. Okay. Now I see where this is going or maybe. Um, right. Uh, and so is this moving towards the suggestion that Macroscopic shape is more than a mere power? I, it's absolutely not moving in any direction at all. It's asking, <laughs> it's asking you to point in a certain direction. Um, um, right, well, uh, there, I mean, suppose, 
if if we're talking about um, seeing and feeling uh, a square thing, those powers are co-located. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that stops short of saying they're the same, right? Um, yeah. You know, okay. So when he's talking about, so it's, it's a, it's a striking and surprising thing how when Locke is talking about, right, okay, so now I need to, I need to go back, I need to look at, um, uh, I need to look, right here, I need to look through my lock um, and uh, look at, I have the lock, where is it? Yeah, here it is. Um, Two. Yeah, ideas of one sense, simple ideas by more than one sense. Is he going to say anything exciting there or not? My guess is not right there's uh and i should have remembered this so book two chapter five um simple ideas of diverse senses the ideas we get by more than one sense are space extension figure rest and motion these space extension figure rest and motion make perceivable impressions both on the eyes and the touch. And we can receive and convey into our minds the ideas of the extension figure motion rest of bodies, both by seeing and feeling. Hmm. But having occasion to speak more at large of these in another place, I hear only enumerate them. So maybe he's thinking of Chapter eight, primary qualities. Um, yeah, um, when he's talking about adequacy though, he treats them all equally. Uh, here he seems to be saying Here he's not calling them qualities, but surely they are qualities. Um, we can convey into our minds these ideas both by seeing and feeling. So, yeah. Um, is there something further I should be concluding from this or a worry I should have? <laughs> well, I, I, no, I'm just wondering, are there then three separate things? There's the idea of shape and there's the visual idea of shape and there's the tactile idea of shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Three different ideas. Or... Right. Um... Right. Here he's describing them as the same idea, the idea of extension, the idea of figure received both by seeing and feeling. Um, I'm tempted to say, yeah, no, I mean, here I need to, I need to, um, I need to think more about lock on simple ideas of diverse senses, I want to say those are two, the, the tactile idea and the visual idea are different and Locke is in effect describing an abstract idea, but um, that's probably me projecting too much Barclay on Locke. Well, have fun with it. <laughs> okay.
Right. Uh, our next um, yeah, that, that, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and uh, it makes me, um, and I, what I want to think about, especially is how that connects with the adequacy stuff. Um, our next question is from Mark. And then after that will be Caitlin and then Kyle. Uh, yeah, I'll convert. One thing that one thing that seems to differ Locke from somebody like Boyle or almost any corpuscularian, and this is another reason why he so seems expresses skepticism about our knowledge of primary qualities. Uh, uh, has to do with the fact that things sometimes act like perfect fluids. And even more strange, we have the phenomena that he talks about of water of acting like a fluid at some times. And the, when the temperature changes for somehow it manages to obtain cohesion. So there's the basic question of what's the nature of cohesion and what's its support. But if you accept pure fluids, perfect fluids, and Newton sometimes seems to talk up, use appeal to those, then you have, let's see, try to explain this clearly. For a corpuscularian, and the quote you had from Boyle, little things have fixed geometries, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But a perfect fluid does not. And you can take any two volumes of the fluid. And if they're, they don't bind each to, to each other at all when they're in a perfect fluid state. OK, so nothing has a permanent geometry. So even when he talks about knowing about figure, that is just possibly just a momentary figure. And it is not something that is retained through time. And so it looks like prima facie, it is this mysterious power of a fluid like water to sometimes bind different parts of the fluid, let's consider them as points, to bind to their neighbors and sometimes relax that binding, right? And um, so certainly being, to be a rigid body then is actually a dis, I guess would be a dispositional trait or a power of a whole mass of points, I guess. That's a, I stated it as a claim, but I'm not trying to make a claim. Uh, but how do we, this is something that this kind of entity, the perfect fluid uh, is something to worry about. And then I'm thinking of that passage where he puzzles about how on earth could we ever understand what, what it is in matter that makes water freeze sometimes and flow at other times? Um, well, so I think uh, Locke uses, um, for Locke, Locke brings up cohesion as uh, a, an example of uh, something he thinks um, we can't we can't understand we can't explain uh, it's part of uh, his um, case for our distance from real essences even if corpuscularianism uh, uh, if if corpuscularianism is true there are things like cohesion we can't explain. And if corpuscularianism isn't true, then we're even worse off because our um, uh, our concept of body is, uh, you know, not in tune with um, the actual nature of bodies. Um, so I think that's uh, I think that that's the role it plays for um, him. But it does. The question is, and. How do we individuate the notion of a body? Okay, I mean, prima, so prima facie having a, a fixed geometry 
that sounds like it is a manifestation of a degree of coherence relative to neighbors from this point of view. So in some sense, this notion that Boyle and Descartes take as the primary notion that we're sure about, the primary notion of being a primary quality is being an object of a certain fixed shape. But uh, it doesn't seem like, uh, and anyway, so, but if rigidity is just comparative coherence, degrees of coherence, uh, then we have to look for something unknown to us. I agree with that to be the actual primary qualities. Is that? Uh, that's probably where this sort of question would uh, push Locke. Um, Though I wasn't clear, uh, can we still, um, does this raise a problem for attributing size, shape, and motion to the ultimate parts, not just macroscopic bodies? Well, in a perfect fluid, any point, right? no, no finite volume has a finite shape. And Take okay. any two points in a perfect fluid, you can move them as far apart as you want without any uh, resistance or tension. Then the more you get binding between those, then you, you start freezing. <laughs> right. But in the perfect fluid, uh, uh, one, surface, uh, one blob flows past another um, without any effort. So if he accepts this perfect fluid, now I don't know exactly where you get the mathematical definition of fluid. But anyway, I, I didn't mean that these, I think these are very interesting questions and it is almost certainly true that they, Locke started out with something that you like a mechanism view where mechanism usually relies upon having fixed geometrical shapes of parts. But with the pressure from perhaps Newton, he starts realizing that our notion of being a hard body is just resistance. That's a power to resist indentation, right? And if we go down that, go down that path, which maybe uh, we get to a different point of view, maybe in the later stuff. This is a, possibly another Newton or other English physicist uh, uh, input. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think of uh, what what Locke is obviously responding to, and Newton is, uh, you know, is worries about um, action at a distance. Uh, but it's um, uh, it's it's certainly interesting if uh, he's responding to more than that, um, and if you can find traces in his discussion of cohesion of the influence of uh, um, Newton or some of Newton's predecessors. Well, I've heard, there is a very good history of cohesion that talks about it really was a, what on earth is going on. And then that passage about how can water freeze sometimes and not and flow freely other times is quite striking. Anyway, thanks. All right, uh, Caitlin. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a case in mind where I am seeing how it would square away with an anti-realist Lockean position, but I'm having trouble um, understanding what Locke as a realist would say about the situation. And I was thinking maybe talking, talking through it would also help me understand better your views on um, Locke's conception of primary and secondary qualities. So I was thinking of cases of cognitive penetration where there's cognitive factors that influence sensory experience. So for example, um, the shape of an object influencing the color, um, so studies have shown that 
you can have the same color of a shape in a circle versus a heart. And um, the color that people see more often is influenced by the shape of the object because of this, um, like previous color associations. Um, I don't know why I was thinking that this may be difficult for a realist Lockean position if the power is in the object and tells us something about the ontology of the object. Mm -hmm. um, I, and that is the only study I know of, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, uh, I'm tempted to say he wouldn't have a problem with that. So, I mean, if we, if we, uh, if we get an idea, the object had the power to produce that idea. Um, let's see, I want to say there was a power, right? Um, in the paper, I'm, uh, I, I, I qualify my claim at one point and say there are powers in objects, though not necessarily only in objects. Um, uh, so let's see, can we allow that the... Yeah, and I was, I, so I guess I was thinking, does the um, object have the power to both produce the gray sensation as well as the red sensation, for example, or red and pink or something like that. That's not a problem. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why that's a problem. Cool. Thanks. I fear that there may be a worry still there somewhere, but I haven't quite located it yet. Um, next is Kyle, then uh, Adam, and then Elliot. Um, um, okay. Uh, oh, uh, hi, Lisa. Thanks for the talk. That was, that was lovely. Um, one way to try to put what I think Caitlin's point might be, and then I'm going to set that aside, right, it is, um, look, if the, if the power is this metaphysically robust thing that's in the object, why does it change when all we, how can it change when all we, we've changed is, is something in our minds or something else? Okay. Right. I, I, don't, so, <laughs> I think that's- Let, me, let me jump in on that because I okay. think I meant to say something along those lines and I stopped short. So yeah, so it has the power um, to produce, uh, you know, such a gray idea under, is the power to produce a gray idea under such and such circumstances and that's a power to produce uh, red ideas under uh, such and such circumstances. And now I guess, I think the, the sort of worry that um, actually occurred to me in passing when I was giving the talk at that point is just that questions that I um, raise uh, to um, Ott and, um, and Paz now maybe could be re raised to uh, to me there, where I where I say, well, if you know if you're going to reduce it, you have to reduce it to something in particular. Um, they might say, if you're going to say um, that uh, powers are produced under such and such circumstances, don't you need to say more about um, what? Uh, what circumstances um, and how produced. And I guess at that point, I might just sort of retreat to the uh, view that, um, you know, simply the negative claim that it's not obvious that uh, Locke or Boyle are con uh, committing themselves to reductionism. Um, okay, so I, th <laughs> I, think, I think that's an excellent um, reply to Caitlin's question. Um, and I'm going to push you a bit on the same thing, but I want to come back to your talk. Uh, um, so um, when Locke is explaining how hopeless it is for us to know the real essences of substances, right? He, he says, uh, look, it's not just that we don't know these real constitutions, 
right? There's a, what he calls a second and more incurable part of our ignorance that is the connections between uh, the, those, that, those primary, that corpuscular in constitution and the uh, things that happen, the secondary ideas that they generate in us. Then he goes on in book four to say, look, um, if we did know that real essence right, of a substance, gold wouldn't even have to exist for us to know what its, its powers were, its properties, mm, right? right? Um, uh, much less would we have to conduct experiments on it, right? We could just deduce it from the, the real essence consisting of both of those things. Now, that picture seems to me to leave no room for a metaphysically substantive kind of power or maybe even any conception of power besides it being sort of a way of speaking about what happens to us, mm -hmm. right? When we're around certain objects, but you wanted something much more robust than that. And so I want to understand how a more robust conception of powers like the one you're, you want us to embrace fits with that story about what real essences are and what we would know if we learn mm -hmm. them. Where, where, where's the room for powers in that? Um, yeah, uh, let's see. So I'm not sure. Um, I don't, I think that I don't want to commit myself to something as robust as you're imagining. Um, and, uh, and maybe this just, I, I guess this just starts, uh, um, started, uh, from my wondering why they were so sure that uh, capacities were um, were reducible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's true that uh, if everything flows from real essences, the real essences determine uh, the capacities. Um, or though, actually, I, I I thought maybe you were going to. Uh, raise a, uh, a question about Locke. Um, if these are capacities to affect us and we can't understand the connection between body and mind, then you might wonder why he thinks the capacities are going to flow. I think the ones that um, uh, flow at least in a way that we can comprehend or imagine comprehending are um, you know things like solubility. Um, uh, the analogy he draws in the gold passage is with, it, it wouldn't be any harder to know those than to know the properties of a triangle, right? Right, yeah. So that, that mathematical thing seems to be <laughs> uh, at the heart of this idea that you, if you knew the real constitutions and the laws connecting them, you'd know everything, right? And so, uh, uh, sorry, maybe I, maybe that's not a helpful, helpful addition, but I was trying to, to narrow in on the sense in which uh, this deducibility claim is, or, or, uh, and sufficiency claim is creating problems for you. Um, it sounds, I, I mean, one way to ask it would be, look, if it turns out on this story, right, never mind Pazna and not and those guys, right, but if it turns out that uh, on the story you're telling that, um, e e yeah, powers are real, but it's just a way of talking about the causal impact on ourselves or on third bodies, that a substance can have, um, are you okay with that? Right, that's the sense in which they real, but it's really just, it's just our limited way of talking about the effects of things. Um, is that substantive enough? Um, so I don't want it to be just a way of talking. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, um, but, yeah, the capacities are supposed to flow from and be determined by uh, the real essences. Because they have to be. Right. And yeah, that's, that's I mean, this, this Locke. may be Locke's problem and not yours, right? I, lots of things Locke sort of does say a little more than you want him to, but I, um, it, it's, it's, this is, I, I've always worried about powers and lock on this on this kind of ground. So. Um, Adam, and then after Adam is going to be Elliot. 
So I, I'm not quite sure if my, my question's distinct from Kyle's. Um, I'll, I'll ask it anyway, and maybe maybe it turns out the response is going to be similar. Um, so um, uh, when, we, we were, when we were talking about uh, reductionism um, and kind of objections to reductionism, uh, as in reducing the, the, the powers to, to just uh, the, the primary qualities of actions, the primary qualities, um, we looked at, at some of Pasnow's objections. Uh, one of them was, well, uh, you know, if the powers are just reducible to the primary qualities, then uh, the powers themselves aren't causally efficacious. Uh, and then you had some problems with, with kind of Pasnow's response here. Uh, and you put it as, well, like maybe there's this category mistake going on uh, because powers don't have causal efficacy. Uh, they, just, they just are causal efficacy. Um, and so I, I just wasn't sure um, quite then how to understand places where Locke talks of powers as being in bodies. Uh, if if causal, if sorry, if powers um, are just causal efficacy, like causal efficacy isn't a thing that is in bodies, uh, but, you know, Locke always talks of powers as being in bodies. Uh, yeah. Maybe this just means like, you know, when he's using the, uh, when he's using in, he means something more like what we now today think of as of, uh, and there's just been some kind of linguistic shift. Uh, I, I wasn't aware that there was this linguistic shift, but maybe that's how I should be reading it. Just wondering if you had thoughts on this. Um, because, and again, if uh, if we want to be realists about the powers, then we need the powers to, to be in the bodies. Um, but if, if powers are just uh, causal efficacy and not things that have causal efficacy. It's just not clear to me how we're getting them into the bodies. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, maybe it means my response to Paz now is too quick. Uh, right. So he definitely, he wants to say um, that powers are in bodies. Ideas in us, qualities in bodies, qualities turn out um, to be uh, powers, um, at least at least some of them. Um, and those are capacities. I, yeah, I said against Pasno that they're, um, they don't have a causal efficacy, they are causal efficacy. Um, is that right? Well, I mean, the other thing I want to say is that uh, it's the bodies that act. Um, the powers what? The powers are their ability to act in a certain way. Um, so the bodies or the things are what, I want to say what have causal efficacy. And then if I switch between efficacy and power, but maybe that's the questionable part. Um, but powers don't have power. That can't be right. Um, so is there a problem with saying they are power? Uh, I'm not quite sure whether there's some slippage in two notion of powers here or not. I guess one option that I feel like you wanted to resist was, well, maybe again, when we're talking about the powers, it's just this uh, useful semantic, like merely linguistic thing. Um, but but then, right, the, the powers wouldn't be in the body. Um, mm -hmm. They're just useful things for referring to the fact that bodies are causally efficacious, and not actual things. But that seemed like something you wanted to resist. Um, I wanted to resist committing, well, uh, I think Locke can't 
um, make that claim uh, because of his claims about adequacy. And I don't think it's obvious that Boyle is committing himself to it. Um, although it is, I mean, that, that I do think that's, uh, that's compatible with Boyle. Um, Elliot? Hi. Um, I was curious if um, Locke says more about what's supposed to happen when you have um, some secondary quality and there's there are natural philosophers going around who are trying to explain this in terms of primary qualities or other things. Um, what Locke thinks, how Locke sees this process going or if there are like constraints on what sorts of explanations one can appeal to or what happens when there's a failure of reduction or failure to reduce the, um, the quality to another set of qualities um, or if there's certain kinds of uncertainty with respect to the reduction that are okay to sit with and wait or others that are damning and show that um, like it could only be granted as a, as a primary quality or, or something like that. Um, so, uh, to the extent that Locke's a corpuscularian, um, uh, he thinks that, um, we can, um, well, that what we should attribute to bodies themselves are just the, uh, primary qualities and secondary qualities are supposed to be explicable um, in terms of them, in terms of uh, the effects on us of um, you know, uh, particles with size, shape, solidity, and motion. Um, I don't think Locke says a lot about um, how good those accounts are um, and uh, the I guess what's already come up is that um, he thinks that there's a variety of reason reasons why we're never going to get uh, a full and satisfactory explanation there um, and like that has to do with uh, different um, sources uh, sources really different levels of um, uh, ignorance. There's our ignorance of the constitutions, there's uh, connections like the body-mind connection where uh, it, it doesn't seem like we could, um, uh, uh, it seems like that con connection completely eludes us. And then there's the fact that we might be wrong about the corpuscularian constitutions. Um, law, uh, sorry, Boyle um, uh, has a lot more to say about color, but uh, a lot of it, I really, um, there's a lot of Boyle. Uh, um, I certainly haven't looked at everything that uh, uh, Boyle says on color, um, and I haven't really looked at uh, any of it recently. In general, Boyle's a lot more optimistic about being able to make progress and being able to improve our hypotheses. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that that, uh, that that addressed at least some of your question, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that was the whole thing. That's a, that's a lot, thanks. Sure, thank you. All right, uh, so we have five minutes left and I'm gonna insert myself into the, to the queue and I'll ask a smaller question. Um, just because of our, our time constraints. Um, but first, Lisa, this was just a great, great talk, a really a fun way to spend uh, two hours. It was beautifully clear and it was just a lot to think about. I have, I think, like seven questions listed. Um, <laughs> there's just a hey. lot there. Um, so let me just first ask you about the distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic. Mm. So I don't remember what Locke says about the extrinsic intrinsic distinction. So it went a little quick why it is that you, um, wanted to characterize being a primary quality in terms of intrinsicness. And so this is just a clarification question. Can you say more about what it is to be intrinsic versus extrinsic? 
And is this Locke's notion or is this a notion and bit of vocabulary that you're using on Locke's behalf? I'm using it on Locke's behalf. Uh, and um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to articulate what I think is a widely shared assumption um, that uh, we exp that um, the that um, mechanists or certainly Boylean mechanists expect the primary qualities to be um, intrinsic. Yeah, okay. So, um, and you're about to press me on solidity, right? No, I just, <laughs> I just want you to. I just want you to say more about what it is for something to be intrinsic. What it is to be intrinsic. In some ways, the thing um, of intrinsic, it, it kind of blends into essential. Sometimes it blends into non-relational. Right. So I guess non-relational, um, built into uh, built into individuals, non-relational, and uh, right. So uh, you've got things with these um, built-in properties that are not relational and then uh, add in spatial relations and um, everything else follows. That's the, um, that's the sort of real essences determine everything um, view that Locke seems to have. Good, so if, that, if the notion of intrinsic is non-relational, um, you pointed to but didn't elaborate on a, a longer section of the paper that you cut out where you're responding to sort of anti-realist readings of oh, yeah, yeah. Locke by saying that that's true powers are relational but there's nothing mind dependent about relational things so can you elaborate more on that because it seems like you're you're yeah. removing the relational properties from the primary qualities because they're not intrinsic but you're saying that Locke doesn't think that relations are mind dependent that's your response to the anti-realist readings so what exactly is the the, the status of the relational properties here? Um, right, uh, that, that is, right, that's a hard question. Um, and it's probably not one I'm in a position to fully answer now. Um, so uh, are you thinking of particular, so what what relational uh, properties are you thinking of? Um, well, you you were just objecting to this general, I took you to be object, objecting to this general premise. You're saying Locke does not hold the view that relational properties are mind dependent. And so the fact that a power is relational doesn't imply that it's mind dependent. And so that was your response to the, oh, I took to be your response to the anti-realist readings, mm -hmm. right? So we have this general, this general idea that um, a relational property isn't necessarily mind dependent, right? But they're gonna be ruled out from being primary qualities. So they won't be essential. So just I want you to elaborate more on this. So the idea is that relational properties, Locke allows them to be, um, uh, real, not mind dependent, but doesn't allow them to be essential. Is that the, is that the line? Um, yeah, I guess I want to say that. So I guess I want to say uh, some relations just follow from two things and their spatial relations, you know, two things with intrinsic properties and their spatial relations. Um, and I guess that could be a general model. Thanks. Um, we are exactly at five o'clock. Um, Caitlin has another question, but I think we're at time. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so join me in uh, thanking Lisa for a really great talk and a great discussion period. Uh, thank you, everybody. That was very fun. Um, and I uh, got a lot of good ideas for further investigation. Great. Um, our last meeting of the Maddie Colloquium is, I believe, one week from today, uh, where John Burgess will be speaking to us uh, at the same time, um, one week from today. So I will see you all then.
Jeremy, I assume there's no time now. Uh, Lisa, do you have a minute now? To... Uh, uh, yeah, though actually I'm gonna, I have to plug in my computer because my, I don't have a good Zoom studio. It's like uh, uh, rigged together and um, right. So I'm gonna turn off the video for a second and go grab my charging cord and possibly reposition this desk a little bit, uh, but I'll be back in a minute and a half. Okay, awesome. There. <laughs> Jeremy, your other six questions. We're talking about six questions. A lot, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot that was interesting in, in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, she's very clear. Mm -hmm. As always. Very clear. Yeah. Okay. Here's the position. Here's my evidence for it. Here's the alternative readings. Here's their yeah. readings. Here's my response. Right, right. Right, right. right? And there's just yeah. like so much underneath. So, um, mm -hmm. the, the pen, did you get a, uh, hi, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna keep, keep talking to Penn about your talk. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I uh, so you asked at the beginning of the question period about the, um, the extent to which the primary quality distinction, primary secondary quality distinction is subject to empirical refutation. That I asked? Yeah, that sort of came up in Lisa's response. That wasn't quite what I thought I was asking. What I thought I was asking. I think, well, maybe I brought it up in talking about sort of the extent to which it's metaphysical. Yes. Ah, oh, I see, right. Versus physical. Right, right. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, but um, Caitlin, go ahead. Caitlin, go ahead. So during the q and I was kind of multitasking and trying to look up this question I had about primary and secondary qualities, but I figured I would ask. <laughs> um, but I'm, I apologize if it's obvious. I, I just um, have kind of an elementary understanding of this. So um, do secondary qualities for Locke always exist well it seems like, like they always have to exist in an object in a physical object of some kind and i'm wondering about um not necessarily cases of hallucination but cases where for example there's that like thing where you stare at a red or a green square for 30 seconds and then when it goes away you see like this magenta color afterwards or things like that um and if those would count as secondary qualities or if that's something else? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I don't think Locke talks a lot about cases of illusion, but he probably does talk about it in places that I don't remember. That's sort of a problem with the essay is there's like weird discussions scattered throughout. Um, what do I want to say? The, uh, those seem like, so a standard model for a secondary quality is it's a power and a body derived from the primary qualities. Um, now, uh, it seems like it's a power to produce ideas in us. Um, and um, like this connects to some questions that came up earlier. Maybe he should say, maybe he would say uh, that um, perceivers, right, relations to perceivers could play a role in individuating the, uh, the powers. Um, uh, maybe he could see that, he could say that. I'm not sure if that would cause any problems elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking was something about time. Uh, delay. So I guess that might not work for all cases, but in some, like the after image case, you might say that the power was in the, well, it's not even a body, it's a projection usually. So I don't really know how it would work there. <laughs> but I was just curious about that. Uh, thank you. Sure. Hey, uh, Professor Dunn, I actually had a question, um, actually two, two quick questions. Uh, I was kind of curious um, to get your um, 
answers to these. The first one is more just a reference question. Um, I'm trying to find um, uh, your talk reminded me of a passage in the essay um, concerning how we pick out um, um, the real essences of objects in the world. And it's a passage about the ring where Locke argues like, why do we not consider um, the, the gold in the ring to include the shape of the ring as opposed to like, you know, fusibility and yellow and dissolves in aquas regis, right? Um, do you know off the top of your head where that's located in the essay? Because I've been looking no. for it. Okay, all right. Um, I'm gonna have to go dig through some old notes from Greg Brown to find that, so. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know where it is. I, I think I'm looking at, uh, I was actually, I had a similar question. <laughs> so I was looking at, I, I, I found the passage. It's uh, oh. book three, chapter three. Yeah, I thought it was in section 18. Chapter yeah. three. Sorry, yeah, book we, three, chapter three. All right, cool, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. so I guess I'll ask my more interesting question besides the referencing one. Um, so you, uh, in the talk you brought up, um, uh, Robert Pasnow's interpretation of primary qualities is involving um, explanatory prior explanatory priority, uh, universality, and causal primacy, um, and that made me think a little bit um, about. And then you discuss why you don't think universality is the right sort of thing to include in the um, primary quality category. But that reminded me a lot of um, Newton's discussion of his third rule of philosophizing. Hmm and the Principia. And I was kind of curious if you had any comments or thoughts about uh, the relationship between the rules for philosophizing and particularly that third rule and Locke's primary quality distinction. So it has been argued that the third rule is influenced by Locke. Um, though I, uh, I'd have to, I can't remember offhand um, who argued that. I saw a reference to this just the other day. Oh, it's um, no, it's V minor, is it? No, no. It's recent book. Older than that? Oh, it's more it's recent. The one, um, you know, Locke and science, Locke and science, and all of the title of it was something like that. Oh, Jacobides. Is it Jacobides? Is he the one who wrote that book? What's the name of his book? Uh, yeah, it's something like that. It's uh, not too fat. It's kind of a skinnyish book. Yeah, I think yeah, I have it here. I think it's in there. Where is it? <laughs> I'd grab it, but I have to file. move everything. <laughs> Maybe I filed it. But yeah. Um, anyway, I think that's where it is. OK. I think there's an earlier place, but um, I'll look. OK. Maybe, maybe. Anyway, sorry, that's all. That's. Uh, but I wouldn't, yeah. I, well, it's okay. I asked for a reference question a second ago. <laughs> so <it's okay. laughs> anyway, um, that uh, it, yeah, it has been argued that Newton is actually influenced by uh, Locke there. Yeah, which seems plausible to me. Yeah, it's it's interesting that Newton reads him as including sort of a universality and with like the primary quality distinction. If he's like, because um, he, he mentions in that third rule that we should take those properties that we right. have by experiment to adhere in the bodies, to adhere in the bodies universally. Um, so I was just kind of curious. Uh, ah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess I was, so I was arguing that um, I don't think it is built into Locke's basic notion of a primary quality well, so I think the core notion is um, is really irreducibility, and I say intrinsic and irreducible, or here I guess intrinsic and foundational, and um, I don't think it's required by that. Well, as as Pasnow says, the universality floats free. Now, might one um, sort of as, take it as a piece of methodology that we should assume? Uh, universality um, until proven otherwise. Uh, that seems okay. Um, and right. And then, and then there's the question of the uh, the grain of wheat and what's the grain of wheat doing. Um, in my view, uh, the grain of wheat is sort of elucidating our uh, concept of 
body uh, and showing that it leads us to the mechanist primary qualities. Uh, so it provides a validation of the, a kind of validation of the list, but not one that tells us um, that those, um, it, uh, it's one that tells us that this is a very natural theory for us. It's not one that tells us that these must be the primary qualities. Um, and one thing I'm wondering now, sorry, this is a little rambling, is how, whether Newton is influenced by that, um, by something like the grain of we thought and what he would have thought is built into that. Yeah. Well, in, his, in Newton's commentary about the rule, he does mention dividing an object on and on and on and on and on again, right. which is exactly like what if I recall what Locke does with the grain of wheat, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting though is that um, it's got to be more complicated for Newton because if um, uh, I take it part of the reading that you you associate with primary qualities is explanatory primacy um, or causal um, primacy. Um, Newton doesn't want to feign any hypothesis about gravitational attraction, and he clearly lumps that in with um, an application of his third rule. It's what he says at the end. is like, look, we see attraction between all bodies, so this is a quality that inheres in the bodies, right? But he doesn't want to say it's action at a distance or anything like that. He says he feigns no hypothesis. So, I mean, the if they are related, there's definitely, I think, areas where they might come apart, where like Newton has a slightly different idea. Um, that's just me thinking off the top of my head though, in response to what she just mentioned. Yeah, sure. And right, he could have been influenced by Locke and there they end up with uh, fairly different views about how to theorize about qualities that's certainly consistent. It is Jacovides. Okay. Pages 89 to 91. Okay. <laughs> Does he reference anybody else? Uh, I only have that. Okay. okay. And do you have the title of the book? No. <laughs> That's easy but to figure. You can't miss it. It's 2017. I know that. Ah, got it. Yeah, actually, I probably have it. Let's see if I printed out the bibliography. Oh, there we go. Locke's Image of the World. It's on the bibliography at the end of my paper. There you go. Thanks, Ben. Yep. I was uh, um, still thinking about this business of I, I, that I didn't articulate very well about what he might have thought as science progressed and things became not so sensory. I was thinking more of things like quarks or, hmm. you know, the different things of the light waves that Newton talked about or something like that that were just, you know, not accessible to any kind of sensory um, thing and whether that would have been, how, how big a, a, a sacrifice he would have thought that was. Would well, that make it unintelligible for, you know, I mean, that would make it unintelligible for him. Or something. Right. He certainly considers the possibility that um, that mechanism is quite wrong and that, yeah. you know, the real, real essences are very different from our conceptions. Um, I think what would uh, floor him more is, you know, messing with our notion of causation, indeterminacy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not quantum sure mechanics would have freaked him out, but it freaked right. everybody out. Right. <laughs> I'm not sure how you would deal with that, uh, though I, I, I'm inclined to think he, ha he doesn't have any good way to rule out um, that possibility, but it's in conflict with his basic assumptions. That it isn't so much I was thinking of it, have, having ways to rule it out. It was more because he clearly does think maybe mechanism isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just that you know, in some of those moods you get that if that happens, then, you know, we're lost and we just can't understand anything and game over, right? I was just wondering if, you know, if it was, if Newton said, well, you know, there, there are gonna be these little rays and they're gonna have this and that's how you can explain color vision, right? Or something, what do you right. say? You know? I mean, I mean <laughs> one thing to say is like Locke, 
uh, Locke wants to persuade us that um, we can have very little knowledge of mm. uh, the natural world. Um, you know, our, uh, uh, our, our simple ideas are fine. They all correspond to powers. Um, mm. And we can have probable opinion. And probable opinion is uh, good and useful. So. Um, ah, OK, OK. I'm not sure he'd actually be that upset. Yeah, because we could at least have probable opinion about that stuff, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I keep forgetting about how strong it is, this, how, how, what science has to be like. Right. I mean, yeah, he does, in some moods, he sounds disappointed that we can't have Scientia. Yeah. But it is, it's a, I mean, it's a point that he's building towards um, and yeah. emphasizing. Yeah. Well, and of course, he's right about that. <laughs> so, so on, this, on this point of Scantia, though, um, and, um, but in particular, the use you make of um, uh, real essences to capture a metaphysical notion of the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. I am, um, so I'm, I'm raising this point as a comment because I think the passages you cite are the essay, uh, book four, chapter six, section seven. I think we'll, we'll uh, yeah, we'll uh, give us that conclusion, namely that we can't know the primary qualities. But I, I don't think that's what you want to say. You want to say that uh, uh, the primary qualities or the ideas you have of them are adequate, um, so that we do have knowledge of them. Um, so my comment, sorry, in short, my comment is this: I think the the passage you might want is uh, exactly the one I was I was typing in here, uh, three, three eighteen, because there, uh, look does say that the simple ideas, uh, the nominal essence and the real essence coincide. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think this might help your argument because it can now, you can still give a realistic reading because you don't have to necessarily um, think of them as uh, in terms of nom uh, as nominal essences because they are, the nominal essences are the real essences. And you don't have to worry about uh, the nominalistic uh, interpretation. That's uh, that would be for all simple ideas. So mm -hmm. it would be true yes, of sir. color also. Uh, yes, but you you also want this to be real. I think you want uh, them to be real insofar as their powers in uh, in the bodies, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think yeah, this will help your argument. At least thanks. I wanted, oh, sorry. I just said thanks. Ah. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask quickly, what was the, which Pasnell book were you referring to? Uh, the metaphysical themes or the- Yeah, metaphysical the, themes. Yeah. Okay. The big one, or maybe, maybe the later ones are equally big. I don't know. Well, the, yeah, the more recent one is not quite as big as the, that's the one we'd actually studied with the, some of my students and I had studied the uh, epistemology book. Um, right. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, I haven't actually made my way through that one. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I, you know, it's kind of a ride, I must say. Um, but uh, I guess I, I told you I wanted to introduce Evan here to you. Ah. He, he's the guy who's working on Barclay. Yeah, you can see who David and Bruce are, of course, too. But Evan is the guy I was mentioning to you. I, it's, 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 uh, it's, good, it's good to meet. Um, I, I actually want to ask a question about Locke also um, on the basis of the talk. Um, the, the, there's, um, there's a, a passage, uh, in, in like, I think it's, in, it's like book two, sec, it's a, a, either book two, section nine, paragraph eight or section eight, paragraph nine, but he, <laughs> he, he seems to endorse, um, like a, a sensory core theory. So it's like, uh, it's like first you have an idea. So, so he's, um, thinking about an example where you're looking at a globe, first you have an idea of a 2d circle. And then through an act of judgment, you sort of enrich that into an idea of a, of a, um, of a globe, of a, of a 3D sphere. 
Um, so, I mean, I'm, I was sort of wondering if that poses any problem for, for the, the doctrine of, of powers uh, in the object. Um, insofar as it, it seems like you don't need that, that judgmental step to get your uh, tangible idea of a, of a globe. But in the vision case, it seems like the, the, the object only gives you like this kind of impoverished two-dimensional thing, and then you actually have to use your mind to enrich it. So is the power kind of like not giving you the same amount of content in the, in the touch case and the, uh, in the vision case? Um, and I also wanted to ask if you thought that that was an example of like an inadequate idea when, when it's merely a, a 2D sphere, or uh, I'm sorry, a, a 2D uh, circle. And then maybe it like becomes adequate when, when you enrich it or, or if that's the wrong way to think about adequacy. Yeah, okay. So the first thing I'm wondering about is are we talking about simple ideas anymore? Perhaps not. Mm. Yeah, perhaps not, yeah. I'm not um, sure. And so then he wouldn't have to, um, he wouldn't, um, it wouldn't have to be an adequate idea. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, it seems to me s sort of related to the line of questioning from the, yeah, from the Molly New case. Um, well, it depends what you think about the Molly New case. And, and here, honestly, I, I need to refresh my memory about like what how much Locke says about uh, processing ideas mm. uh, and how that fits into his theorizing. Uh, and I mean, I think that's a very interesting line of investigation, which I haven't thought about recently. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you're, working on, you're working on the new theory of vision? Yeah, yeah, I've I've been uh, I've been working on, I guess like two sort of interrelated papers that that are, that are mostly about that. Um, I guess one on the heterogeneity thesis, um, which I'm trying to kind of like deflate that and make it um, less of a problem for the idea that that you can uh, phenomenally see like you know uh, depth and and um, you know that, that 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 more of the stuff you immediately see kind of makes it into your phenomenal visual experience. Yeah, I want to maybe you could ask Lisa if she has an opinion about that one because frankly, yeah, yeah. people seem to disagree on whether you know once you get your tactile ideas mixed in with your visual ones, then you have an experience. Whether it's a phenomenal sort of visual experience of a three D world, or whether it's still the flat thing, but you have some judgments that uh, that are added to right. it. Do you have a theory, a, a view about that? I I, um, I feel like in the past I've followed uh, Margaret Atherton's um, uh, yeah. early book, mm -hmm. uh, and am I right in thinking that she would see? Uh, I know that uh, so she would say we learn to see distance, yeah, and that with an with an emphasis on see. And so I'm thinking she thinks it changes the phenomenology or it's okay for it to change the phenomenology. Yeah. And, I, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I have trouble um, understanding what, what Atherton exactly thinks about this because she, she says that she says and she emphasizes we see distance. And then in other places she says, Barclay's view is that we can't see distance. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I've, um, I feel like sometimes it's it's um she, she doesn't seem to have like a term for like you know phenomenal seeing versus mm -hmm. some kind of you know non phenomenal judgmental seeing. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody um so so Pitcher also thinks that it's uh, that we don't phenomenally see distance right? I, I think so. He the, the language he uses is he says all we literally see is a flat expanse of light and color. You know when, right. when we're looking at a tree that's like twenty feet away from us or something. Right, and then we think we see distance, but that's an illusion. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. yeah. So who who actually is explicit? Does Schwartz think that we? Um... Well, so yeah, yeah. So there's like a new a new paper um, that I found by by Schwartz from 2019, where he um, well, so so I I haven't I haven't finished yet, but I, I think he's going to say that um, we can we can uh, phenomenal see distance. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, I inter inter interrupted you, Evan, when you were asking, but I just wanted to see if Lisa had a had a view because Barclay was your original guy, right? Yep, yep. Uh, my <laughs> dissertation was on Barclay's demo too. Oh, cool. Uh, and yeah, so uh, I mean, I've I've worked mostly on his philosophy of science. Uh, mm -hmm. And really, I've not published on the theory of vision, though I, 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 when I, if I teach a Barclay seminar, I teach the new theory. Um, right. I mean, I'm inclined to the view uh, that it changes the phenomenology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah uh, we, and so I like the, I mean, I like the claim that we, we learn to see distance we do so we do do so immediately um but that doesn't mean that we don't in the end see it right and so i yeah i guess i assume the phenomenology is is uh, affected yeah that's the line that evan's trying to defend mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> trying to sort of so I, I guess like i've been thinking that um the heterogeneity thesis might pose a problem for that um, I mean, in particular, that there's the argument about you, you can't, um, right. like the, the visible and tangible lengths are incommensurable. Um, and then the, there's a, a Margaret Wilson paper where she says, imagine you have like a, a length of pipe in your wall and then and the pipe bends and goes back into the wall. So you have to like reach back to feel how far back the pipe goes. <laughs> oh, right. And can't so you add them together? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> right. You see about a foot and you feel about a foot or something. <laughs> So it sort of seems like a compelling uh, <laughs> argument. So, so um, I guess I, I'm I, like like the line that I sort of want to take on the heterogeneity thesis is that it's uh, so so I, I guess the whole thing has to depend on his view of sorts of like like what it takes for two things to be of the same sort. I mean, I'm thinking of the heterogeneity thesis like uh, narrowly as the denial that you can have um, uh, any visible and tangible ideas of the same sort. Uh, and so uh, I'm I'm trying to argue that like to be of the same sort, two things have to have a, a likeness and conformity with each other in the way that he talks about in the principles, uh, which is the sort of thing that allows the, the natural philosopher to formulate a law of nature. So, for, so in the principles he talks about like, um, like, like waves gravitating toward the moon and like an object falling, you know, have a likeness and conformity with each other. And the natural philosopher notices that and he says, oh, there's like a, a regularity in nature here. Um, and so my thought is if, if Barclay thinks that that's what it takes for two things to be of the same sort, then in, in denying that visible and tangible ideas can ever be of the same sort, he's sort of like denying that they can ever be, um, that, that they can ever like sort of you know, support the same laws of nature basically in, in the same way. So mm -hmm. then I'm trying to go through and show that like throughout, new, throughout the new theory of vision, he like consistently sort of um, talks about visible and tangible ideas in ways that so it sort of makes it impossible for them to ever like, I mean, I mean, they play completely heterogeneous, like sort of causal roles in, in nature, as it were. I mean, for Barclay, you can't talk, you, they're not really causal, but um, anyway, that's the line that I'm trying to- That's interesting though, I, uh, let's see. So I'm tempted to try to resist by saying, I mean, it seems like the heterogeneity is supposed to be manifest uh whereas if you're gonna figure out whether um there are regularities or um natural laws that relate these two things it seems like that would take uh, a fair bit of experience yeah um well, so, so I, I certainly think that he does think that had that visible and tangible ideas, I mean, they can't have any like phenomenological resemblance with each other. They can't have maybe any, any kind of resemblance relations with each other. I, I guess I'm just denying that that, that sort of um, phenomenological point is his reason for saying that they can't ever be of the same sort. Um, and so I, I, I guess like the line, I mean, more broadly, I'm trying to suggest that uh, there's kind of like a family of, of claims he makes throughout the new theory that have to do with the difference between visible and tangible ideas. So I mean, mm -hmm. some of them are, are really vague, like that, you know, they can't have any affinity with each other or, or like they're, you know, they're very, very different from each other. Um, and so I think, I mean, he does make these claims that they can't, you know, that, that like, like manifestly uh, phenomenologically, they're not anything at all like each other. But I think that's just part of this like family of 
claims where he's just like really wants to say they're really, really different from each other. But, um, you know, sort of more narrowly, I think his reason for saying that they can't ever be of the same sort is like this more, it's sort of more based in his philosophy of science. Um, hmm. anyway, and, and, and then I want to say that, you know, he's just making a mistake in saying that they can't resemble each other phenomenologically. But then it becomes maybe like a more forgivable mistake if, if it doesn't undermine the whole, um, the whole heterogeneity thesis. I mean, because that would be a problem. Yeah, yeah it would. Though why, isn't it, it seems more plausible to me to say they aren't phenomenologically alike than to say they're not um, regularly connected in experience. Well, so, so, so they certainly are regularly connected to each other in experience, but, but they play heterogeneous roles. So, so, okay. vi so visible ideas function as signs and they forewarn us from a distance about tangible objects, but they can't interact with our bodies at, at all. Whereas to tangible objects are like, you know, they can interact with our bodies in all kinds of different ways. Um, and they, so they feel like they function as uh, signifieds. So that's like, sort of, if you look at like the sort of visual language, um, sort of sign signified thing as like a really highly general law of nature. Um, and then I think more specifically, visible ideas of um, um, extension, figure, magnitude, and, and motion, because of um, the way that like, like the laws of perspective work, you, you, you sort of, there's like, all kinds of different visible ideas of magnitude and figure and stuff that, that, that I can experience. Um, but there's sort of only one tangible figure um, and tangible and only one tangible magnitude. I mean, but Barclay seems to, he, he sort of, that seems to be his way of modeling like perceptual constancy. It's like you have the sort of invariant tangible qualities and then the, the, the visible qualities vary in all kinds of different ways. Um, and so if there's sort of like a, a many to one mapping of um, like, like take magnitude, for example, you have lots of different varying visible magnitudes, but just one tangible magnitude. That means that, um, and that probably means that um, all those visible ideas can be signs for the tangible idea, but the tangible idea can't really be a sign for any one of those as opposed to an, another one. Um, and it doesn't seem like it can't be a sign for all of them. So, so in other words, I, I think in, in those cases, the, the signification relations, it only goes in one way. Mm. So it's like asymmetrical. So, so again, like you can't, you can't switch visible and tangible ideas around in the sort of ordering of nature. Um, that's at least the, the spirit of the heterogeneity thesis on, on this reading. Um, hmm. I, I don't know if any, you know, it may, it may sound uh, impossible. It's, it's helpful to try to, to run this by you and see what, you know. I mean, it sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa wasn't expecting to be talking about Barclay today, though, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but I think she, she, she was forced to with uh, the Molino problem, which is related <laughs> to what Evan is talking about. So yeah. I think that the, with the Molino problem, you can... You know, yes, you almost ended make... up having to talk about Barclay. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're forced to make this distinction between tangible and visible ideas. Um, so that, so uh, perhaps the question for Evan, so in the, in the Molino problem case, would the distinction be phenomenological or not? Uh, the, the distinction between the, uh, the so, so, you have, so you have a newly sighted Molyneux person who yeah. just starts having visible ideas now for the first time. Uh -huh. So sorry, so, so what distinction, the distinction between those visible ideas and the tangible ideas? Yeah, so does, he, does, does the person come to uh, have a, you know, um, come to experience something that's distinct phenomenologically or something that's distinct um, based on other, other than uh, phenomenological experience? Um, well, so I, I mean, I, I guess I would think that for Berkeley, like when, when, when you, when you uh, then the, the newly cited Molyneux person initially has some kind of like impoverished visual experience that, mm -hmm. that wouldn't really resemble the, the richer tangible experience and then, then you would set up the associative connections and learn to immediately see and get like a phenomenological. So, so I, I think, so the immediately seen experience, I think would be phenomenologically richer and like more, more depthy and three-dimensional than the, the immediately seen one. That's, that's the, that's the view I would take. <laughs> I mean, yeah. 
Uh, I think uh, as fun as this is for us, uh, I think we need to let Lisa have a break because it's uh, <laughs> late at night where she is and she's been talking to us. For that, a was, that was fun, but I, I, I should check whether uh, dinner has manifested uh, itself in, the, uh, in other parts of my house. Thank you. Um, it was great to be able to do this. Uh, thank yep. you, uh, everybody, for coming. Thanks for uh, Penn for being the occasion. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jeremy, for introducing me and the whatever facilitating. Um, yeah. well, thank you, Lisa. That was really, uh, really a, a treat. Really a pleasure. Yeah, I, I have to. I'm. I'm I'm sorry that it only occurred to me like yesterday. I mean, so yesterday I looked up to check whether I was the first of these talks or not. And, uh -huh. and, and finally had the thought, oh, I could have gone to other of these talks. Oh, um, yes. And I'm sorry that I didn't. And I, I will go to Burgess, except I think we have an early modern speaker next Friday. Uh, I think it's Julie Walsh. And if it's not, then I'll definitely be here for the Burgess talk. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, you missed um, his, talk, his talk. Oh, but wait, it's California time. So I should be able to do it. I'll, uh, anyway, hopefully I will. Uh, <laughs> John, John Burgess, well, right. John Burgess taught me logic at, uh, at Princeton. Oh. So it was, Is that right? Oh, it of was course. fun to see him today in the audience. Oh, good. Well, then, yes, you will enjoy hearing John, whatever he talks about. <laughs> well, it sounds like, like an excellent topic, too. Okay, well, um, well, Jeremy, you're the host. I'm not doing this. <laughs> oh, okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Good night, everybody. Sign off. Bye. Bye.